Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm supposed to be talking three hours on primary purpose. Well, forget it. <laughs> three hours. Well, I'm going to talk. First, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, something that I like to talk about particularly, and it's the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and it's, it's a, a history you don't hear very much about. It's a history that doesn't begin in Akron, Ohio. In fact, it ends in Akron, Ohio. And I think that it's a true story. It's a good AA story, and, and like all true good AA stories, it has a moral to it, which is consistent with uh, our primary purpose, about which I will speak probably a great length in a little while. I also brought over where Al is a, something I wrote all 10 or 11, maybe 12 years ago on this subject, and I brought some copies, and you can have them, and you can uh, copy them and do anything you want with it. All of this is covered in, in my six-volume work, hum- Humility and Beyond. <laughs> Humility and Beyond has, has been a great, great seller, and uh, this is all covered there. Now, anyhow, I want to talk to you about this issue because I think it's important, and I sure do like the way I tell it. Now, I don't know. Where, where AA had its origins. I don't know where a spiritual force, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, where it begins, I don't know. Movements such as ours, which are spiritual, usually have their origins uh, in the mind of God, somewhere. And that's a difficult place to locate. Well, I'll tell you when it began to become evident to me, I discovered this. In, around before the First World War, in the 1910s or so, a cast of characters began to assemble in a little town in Vermont, Manchester, Vermont. Manchester, Vermont is a very beautiful place. It's in the southern portion of Vermont. It's at that point of the state of Vermont where the states of Massachusetts, New York, and Vermont all come together. It's a resort town. Uh, it's got a golf course. It's got a big hotel. It's even got a little mountain, the Equinox Mountain. It's got a lake. It's a really a nice place. And uh, down from East Dorset, Vermont, which is about 12 miles up Route 7, which used to be the main north-south route before the interstate, down from there came this Bill Wilson. He went to come to the prep school. There was a prep school in Manchester. I think it's still there, the Manchester Academy. Came down with his violin, his boomerang, and his baseball glove. He enrolled in the prep school. And then over from Albany, New York, which is only about 30 miles to the west of the capital of New York State, came another young man named Ebby uh, Thatcher, whose family was very prominent uh, accountants. They were CPAs in Albany, and they had this beautiful home right on the main, main street of of, Act, of uh, Manchester, Vermont. And then up from Brooklyn, New York, came this physician, Dr. Burnham, with his lovely daughter, Lois, about whom we all know. And then from New York City, by way of Newport, Rhode Island, came a very, very rich young man named Roland Hazard, whose family had a farm about 20 miles outside of Manchester. And these young people, all in their teens, who had no possible idea of what the future was going to hold for them or us, began to mix, as do young people everywhere. And uh, and they, they had all of the social lives that you and I had at that age. And then the war came, the big war. Uh, Bill, uh, of course, tells us in our book, that he was off to the Army. Bill had graduated Norwich University, which is a, a small college up in Northfield, Vermont, and it's uh, got a big ROTC presence, and he was part of that. And he had a, a second lieutenant commission in the Vermont National Guard, which was a field artillery unit. And so he was off 
as our book says, to Westminster Cathedral and then to France for the war, and the rest of them dispersed. When the war was over in 1919, 1920, they reassembled in Manchester, Vermont, this crowd, and uh, they enjoyed the, the company of one another again, and uh, you all know Bill ended up marrying Lois and uh, went back to live in Brooklyn. He went back to... Uh, he got a job with an insurance company, and he went to law school at night. And he got about his life, which included a lot of drinking, and so did the rest of them. The first one to get in serious trouble with the booze was the rich kid, Roland Hazard. And Roland came up a really unmanageable alcoholic, and his family did everything they could to, to uh, help him. They brought him to all of these sanitaria. Uh, you know, these, this is not a new problem. This problem has been going on forever and ever. There's always been places for rich people to go dry out. And so they sent Roland all around, but it, you know, it didn't work. So they finally sent him in desperation to the greatest psychiatrist of the time, Carl Jung, the colleague of Sigmund Freud, who had his own hospital in Switzerland. And Roland Hazard went over there and stayed a whole year with uh, Jung. And uh, he was pronounced and certified and all the rest of it. And he was sent home. And he started back and he got as far as Paris. When someone asked him the wrong question. <laughs> Somebody said to Roland, would you like a drink? Uh, the only time I said no to that question, I completely misunderstood the question. <laughs> so Roland had a drink. In fact, he had more than several. And uh, he went back to Young. He said, look at this. Look. I said, well, you, you would have done or I would have done. He said, I'm a whole year with you. All that money, all that time, and now I'm just, just as bad as ever I was. And Young didn't really appreciate the fact that uh, Roland Hazard was an alcoholic. And he said to him, I have never seen an alcoholic of your type recover. Never. You're going to die from this thing. And of course, when you get, you got news given to you like that, Roland immediately said, is there no possible way out? And Young said, yeah, there is. Here and there, now and then, once in a while, very, very rare. It's a phenomena. It's not repeatable. It's not science. People like you have a religious experience. And that takes care of it. They have a transference of religion into takes care of their alcohol. But apart from that, you're dead duck. And you're finished. And forget about it. Well, it's nice to have money. <laughs> because Roland went out to buy himself a spiritual experience. And he found for sale the Oxford Group. And uh, he took the Oxford Group, a bunch of them, and now this is in, we're in the 1930s now. He took a bunch of these people to Manchester, Vermont. And he turned his father's gentleman's farm into a commune for the Oxford people. And they had 25, 30 people. This is the middle of the Great Depression in, uh, in the United States. Everybody's wiped out. And he's feeding them, and he's got all the money. He's got the, and he, they got a free ride, and they, they live together. They do all of the Oxford stuff together. And they're up there in Manchester, Vermont. The next one who got into trouble was Evie Thatcher. Evie's family exiled him from Albany, New York. And they sent him out of town. He was an embarrassment. They made him go live in the summer house over in Manchester, Vermont. I, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Albany, New York. <laughs> but being exiled from Albany, New York is like <laughs> being exiled from Newport News, you know. <laughs> A Navy veteran speaks, speaks to you. <laughs> uh, the first thing Abby did to cause, a, you know, pep things up a bit was come around the corner and into a farmer's kitchen in his car. Very tricky corners in Vermont. And uh, and he stepped out of the car and asked if anybody had a drink. Well, Vermonters are not notorious for their humor. And neither was this guy, so they got the cops and they had him in front of the local judge and the local judge gave him the speech. I used to be a judge. I gave the speech many times. You know, if I ever see you again, he went through the whole thing. 
So after he got out of that, and he did, he had some fit of alcoholic remorse, you know, that thing that we used to get, oh dear. So in order to square things, he decided he would paint the family house. Now we're talking about one of these Victorian things with the spires and the towers, and they're very big. It's right on the main street of uh, Manchester, Vermont. Now he knows nothing of painting, but he's alcoholic, so he doesn't have to know anything about painting. <laughs> Uh, so he goes out and he buys some paint and he buys a brush and he gets a ladder and he gets, you know. The trouble is he could only get up to the second rung of the ladder. He kept falling off the ladders. But he did get a little spot painted and then he did what we all wanted, would do. He got a beach chair and a quart of booze and he decided to sit down and sort of watch his paint, you know, make sure it bask in the glory. Of. And while he was doing that, a pigeon had the temerity to take a shit upon the paint, <laughs> which so enraged Eddie that he went into the house and came back out with a shotgun. Now you have a lunatic drunk with a shotgun shooting at pigeons on the main street of Manchester, Vermont. <laughs> and here's Eddie back in front of the same judge. And the judge is prepared to, to you know, throw the book, as we say. But it is the United States of America. He does have certain rights, and they give him a phone call. Well, who would you call? He called his rich friend, Roland, up at the farm. He says, I'm in trouble. with." And down came Roland with two other guys from the farm. And Roland said to the judge, we'll take him. You don't have to put him away. We'll take him. We'll take care of him. And they did. They got Ebby, and they bring him back up. And now Ebby's up at the farm with Roland, and the both of them are not drinking. And we're into around October of 34. It's cold in, in Vermont. I went to college up there. And, uh, our Columbus Day, it starts to turn. It gets a little cold. And so, Roland, when you're rich, you don't have to be cold. He said, let's go back to New York where he had the big place. And uh, so he and Evie come down to New York. Now, this is in the Depression, 34. And in the Depression in this country, there were a thing called soup kitchen. They're all over the place. And they were free food. And a lot of people needed free food. I'm not talking about alcoholics or pathological people, just people. Ordinary people who didn't have food. And you went through the soup kitchen, you got soup, you got a sandwich, you got an apple in most of them. I remember. And uh, the Calvary Church, which is an Episcopal church, Dr. Shoemaker, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in the 30s, if you go there this very day, you'll see the main window is a, a gift of the Hazard family. They contributed to the church. And they maintained the soup kitchen. And uh, so Bill, uh, every rather, Thatcher and Roland Hazard were on the soup kitchen, handing out the soup to the people coming through. Part of the Oxford group, part of their spiritual life. And uh, Ebby testifies. Ebby says the thought came to him, and he doesn't know where it came from. I should call my friend Bill Wilson. Where he doesn't, he said it just buzzed into his head. One day he with the soup. So he called Bill Wilson. Bill says the phone rang. I picked it up. He said it was my friend. And he said he wanted to come visit me. And I said, come right out. And then he went out to Brooklyn. It's half hour from where he was. And, uh, he rings the bell and Bill says this is terrific because Bill has three quarts of bathtub gin. In those days they used to make it in the bathtub. They clean out the bathtub, fill it up with, with the water and the still spirits some juniper berries, stir it around, and that was called gin. And Bill had three quarts of it. He said he had hidden it all around the house, and he had just one more part. He wanted to hide one more bottle to get through the night. But he knew he could get drunk that day and one more day. He said that in our book. And the doorbell rings. He opens the bell, and there's Abby. And Bill says he would look forward to this. He said they were going to talk about the old days, you know, what you and I would do. If some bum showed up that we used to drink with, right? Talk about the good old days. He said, about Bill says in our book about the chartered flight. Bill Wilson and Evie Thatcher were the first people to land at the Manchester Vermont Airport. The reason they were the first ones to land at the Manchester Vermont Airport is they landed the day before it opened. <laughs> they made a small error and about the timing, and they were very drunk. And they rolled off the plane, and the local high school band was rehearsing for the next day's opening, and, and these two thought it was for them. And they came off the plane, my fellow Americans, you know. 
And Bill thought this is what he would do with Abby. He would sit in the kitchen, you know, they'd have a drink, remember the time we did this, remember the time we did that, all that great stuff. So they go into the kitchen, Bill pulls out the gin, and he takes another look at Abby. And he says in our book, something happened to the old boy. And he said to him, he says in our book, come now. He says, what happened to you? And Abby said, I got religion. And Bill said, oh, God. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot this summer, a religious crackpot. Oh, well, more gin for me. Now, Ebby is full of the Oxford group. You remember when you and I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, that first surge of spiritual power that came into our lives when we were full of AA. We were going to call up our cousin Charlie. Stop drinking, Charlie. We're going to, you know, get out there and, by God, make a difference. Until we develop into, wow, wow, who gives a shit there? <laughs> and this is Emmy. He's full of it. And he, Bill says, he starts at Bill. Bill, I want to hear it. Bill, no, please. You know, Bill had gone to school. He liked scientists. His degree in, uh, his college degree was in electrical engineering. You know that? So he was that kind of a, had that kind of a mind. And they didn't want to hear about all this business about the Oxford School. But then Emmy said the thing, that really got Bill's attention, and he said it so, it got his attention so much that they italicized it in the book, they underlined it, and he said to Bill, you can form your own concept of God, with us, with the Oxford group. It's God as you understand it. Bill had never heard that. Bill was Episcopalian, you know, God, frozen people. Uh, <laughs> you can't form your own concept of God if you're an Episcopalian or a Catholic or anybody else. You take the, they got it already before you showed up. They got one. Here it is. This is our God. But, and it got Bill's attention. He said, this is to himself. It's a wonderful thing. He did not stop drinking. He did not stop drinking. He went to town hospitals a couple more times. He had a terrific bout on uh, Veterans Day, November 11, 1934. And then finally, his sobriety day is December the 11th, 1934. And on December the 11th, he buys three bottles of beer, does Bill and goes up to town's hospital. Now, the grapevine a couple of years ago, or more, more than a couple of years, I guess, uh, reprinted the, a picture, a photostat, or printing, or whatever the hell you call it, of Bill's admission form in town's hospital. He said he'd been there eight times before, and that the bill had been paid by his brother-in-law, $125, by Lois's brother, who was a nasiopathic physician. And uh, it had all his, you know, his height, his weight, his blood pressure, all that stuff, stuff his hospital chart. Bill says he got into the hospital and Ebby came to see him. That was the first thing. He called up Ebby. And Ebby says, my schoolmate visited me. I want to make sure I have, uh, I don't like to, to uh, quote the book unless I have it, because I don't want to misquote the book. I got Sammy's book here, which is well used. And he says about the hospital, my schoolmate visited me. I fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. We made a list of the people I had hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. I expressed my entire willingness to approach these individuals admitting my wrong. Never was I to be critical of them. I was to write all such matters to the utmost of my ability. My friend promised me that when these things were done, I would enter upon a new relationship with my Creator. I would have the elements of a way of living which answered all my problems. Belief in the power of God plus enough willingness, honesty, and humility to establish and maintain the new order of things with the essential requirements. Now notice, uh, see, I have an attitude about AA. <laughs> That's a, a, a gross understatement. And I have opinions, and I don't necessarily want to inflict my opinions on you, because we don't share opinions, we share experience. Well, my sobriety date is November 24, 1965. And I said to my sponsor, how many of those meetings with those people do I have to go to? He said, yeah, we thought about you. 
Seven a week will do. <laughs> so I don't know, push me around. I went to nine, and uh, and now I go to eight. So I've been to a lot of AA meetings. So my opinions are based on experience. <laughs> and here is here is one of my basic opinions. Alcoholics Anonymous does not have to do with alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous has to do with establishing a relationship with God. That is one of my basic things. And don't tell me you don't believe in God, because I don't give a goddamn what you believe in. <laughs> Believing in God has nothing to do with it. I got some fool now that I sponsor. He don't want to say the third step prayer. He says he's an atheist. I said, you can be an atheist. I don't care. No one cares what you believe, you moron. You probably believe the world is flat. I'm not telling you what to believe. I said, I'm telling you what to do. You will say the third step prayer. Well, I'm going to have a drunken atheist on my hands and I can't handle it. Now listen to what Abby told Bill. Wouldn't you think, if you had a friend like Bill, that's drinking his alcohol, wouldn't you say to Bill, listen, you'll stop drinking? Wouldn't you say that to him? You're going to be able to stop drinking, Bill. You'll finally get that monkey off your back. You're going to be okay. You're not going to have to sit up all night and drink that crap gin. You're not going to have to move your bed down the floor so you don't jump out the window. Abby didn't say that to Bill at all. He said, you will enter with a new relationship with your creator. You will have the elements of a way of living which will answer all your problems. That's what he told him. And that's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spiritual awakening. Drinking is just a symptom of what's the matter with me. Drinking was never my problem. It was never your problem either. Did someone have to teach you how to drink? Do you have to say, where do I stand? <laughs> how do I hold this, you know? Please. Please. Now, Ebby goes. Ebby leaves. It's all over. Bill now feels the way you and I felt that day before we came here. Remember that? You'll never forget it, will you? Huh? When Bill, Bill says of himself, quicksand spread in all directions. You remember that? You knew you'd gone too far. That was all over. And you know, you know that, that thing, let me explain this to you. Like, you'll understand this. I know you will. It comes at four o'clock in the morning. Remember it? And it comes into the room and it wakes you up. And your body says, I need a drink. And it's four o'clock in the morning. And you may be in bed with someone, but you're all alone. And the bullshit is all over. And the bombast and the bravado and all that stuff, it's all finished. And you know it's got you. By the throat, and there's not a goddamn thing in the world that you can do about it. Now you can get up and have a couple of drinks, but it's very tricky because you gotta get up at seven and go to work anyhow. So you gotta work chemistry. You know, if I have three, if I can take, if I finish this bottle like I want to, then you know. And the Irish call that the creature. I don't know why, the creature. And the creature has you. Get you by the, yeah. And that's what happened to Bill. Bill gets in the, the little hospital bed there. Birdie's hospital bed. And the creature's got him. And he can't, he can't sit, he can't lie still, he can't turn, he can't. So he ends up on his knees on the floor. And Bill says, if, if there is a God, let him show himself now. And Bill reports that the room lit up with a light so intensive that he no longer could see the wall. And that in his mind's eye, he was transported to another dimension and a wind blew through that room. And he said to himself, so, this is the God of the preachers, the thing I've heard about. Now it subsided, of course, and he sent for Silkworth. The great Silkworth came and Bill said, Bill is an experienced alcoholism and patience his eighth time. He says in the book, I was on the verge of the DTs. And he knew it. And he said to Silkworth, what do you think? And Silkworth said, well, I don't know. I wasn't here. You know, I'm a scientist. I wasn't here. 
Well, you look a lot better now than you did a few hours ago. So whatever happens to you, you better use it. And Bill did. And, and Bill got out of there, and he went down to the soup kitchen with Evie and Roland. So now there's three of them handing out the soup. And Bill was trying to sell his story to the people coming through the line, some of whom are out alcoholics. And also, in every neighborhood in New York, there's a bar in every corner. So he's going through the bars around there in the 30s, and he's trying to interest people in the fact that his room lit up. <laughs> See, in New York City, has a, people, I'm from New I was born in, in New York City. I grew up, I was born in the Bronx. I grew up there, blah, blah, blah. People like me from New York have a certain attitude. And it does not include somebody coming into a bar Ask tell him to tell me about his room lighting up. You know what I'm saying? The New York response to that is, yeah, light this one up, Charlie. You know, <laughs> jump up here and take a light. I'll show you something. So he went back up to Silkworth. He said, I'm going into these people. Well, imagine if, if if all of that had happened to you, if God had showed up in your hospital room. My God, you know. And Bill said, yeah, he said to Silkworth, nobody wants to pay any attention to me. And so I said, that's not the message. You got the wrong message. The right message is the same message that Young gave to Roland. You're going to die. That gets their attention. Tell them, emphasize to so quick the fatal nature of this disease. Now he has to go to Akron, Ohio. Now we're getting Akron, Ohio. How he goes to Akron, Ohio? You all know the story. It's Mother's Day weekend of 1935. Everybody goes back to New York, his crowd, for the Mother's Day. He's got ten bucks. He can't afford to go back. He's in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, and he's thinking about having a drink in a gay bar. It says he could hear that gay crowd inside. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> now, here's a guy... Here's an alcoholic who had God in his room in November, December. He had God, Almighty God, in his room in December, and he wants to go into a bar in May. This shows you God is good for, what, six months? <laughs> but he doesn't do that. He makes a series of phone calls, and he ends up with Henrietta Cyberling. And here's where it really gets interesting, really gets interesting. I'm a lawyer, and I used to try cases. And this is the proof. This is it. This is the one you could sell right to with anybody. Henrietta Seibling is the estranged daughter of Frank Seibling, Jr. Frank Seibling, Sr. is the chairman of the board of Goodyear Rubber. Just recently, I saw her on cable TV, Castles of America, and there was a Seibling Castle. What an enormous thing it is. And Henrietta's living in the gatehouse because her husband, Frankie Jr., is a boozer and a bum, and she can't live with him. And every, the whole family knows it, so they give her the gatehouse. She's a member of the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group of Akron, Ohio, had a practice, and the practice was, they had many practices, but one of the practices was, on the first meeting of the month, any member of the group could stand up and talk about a problem, much the same we do in our, in our meetings. You know, anybody got a problem, that kind of thing? <laughs> So the first meeting in May, Dr. Robert Smith, local proctologist, we dress him up, we call him a surgeon. He was a proctologist. Not a bad speciality you're going to deal with a lot of alcoholics, I'll tell you. <laughs> Dr. Bob Smith stood up at the first meeting of the Akron uh, Oxford Group meeting, and he said, I have a drinking problem. And they knew it. They all knew it. He didn't think they did, but they all did. And then they agreed, it was part of the Oxford Group thing, they agreed, each one of them agreed, that every morning they would get on their knees and pray to God to send help for Bob. And here's Henrietta, the top of Akron society, a lovely lady, with enormous wealth and all the rest of it, and her phone rings. And there's a voice on the other end of the phone, she has no idea says, my name is Bill Wilson. I am a rummy from New York, and I have a way to fix drunks. That's what he said to her. And she said, of course you do. <laughs> you, you see? 
Henrietta is a woman of faith. Henrietta knew, like she knew her own name, that if she asked God to send help for Bob, God was going to send help for Bob. That's all it was to it. Henrietta said later, now her son was the congressman from uh, Akron, Ohio, might still be for all I know, and he he put all of this stuff in the congressional record when she died in the 70s. And, uh, he called it my mother's involvement with AA. It's a very interesting thing if you ever see it. Anyhow, she said she wanted to look this guy over, make sure he wasn't an axe murderer or something. So she said, come on out, and he came out, and they talked for a while, and she became convinced that he was okay, so where are you staying? He said, the Mayflower. Oh, you can't stay. She put him in the golf club, the Akron Golf Club. Set him right up. And then she called uh, Dr. Bob's house. She got Ann, Bob's wife. It's the Saturday of Mother's Day weekend. And uh, she says, I have the guy here to fix Bob. <laughs> because Ann was a member of the Oxford group, too. And she said, to, and, and Henry ever said to him, just like you'd say it's Tuesday, the guy's here to fix Bob. You know, you better bring Bob over and get him fixed. And Ann said, I'd love to, but he's passed out under the table. He brought home a potted plant. She said, he's more potted than the plant. And I have learned, she said, from long experience to let sleeping drunk sleep. But I'll have him out first thing in the morning. Now, you know first thing in the morning how Bob felt. And here's his wife. We're going out to Henrietta's. <laughs> There's a man out there who's going to fix you. <laughs> And Bob says, I will give that guy from New York. That's how they talk about Bill out in Akron to this day. That guy from New York. He said, I'll give that guy from New York 15 minutes. The meeting lasted five hours. And you remember that, that uh, television thing they did? Bill W. was a very effective thing with James Garner and uh, James Woods. You remember that? Very effective scene. And, and Woods is, is Wilson and Garner is Smith. And, and uh, they're meeting there. And they're in... in, in uh, Doctor in the any other study and uh, Garner has had medical attitude, you know. He said, uh, "Just how do you think you're going to help me, Mister Wilson?" And Wilson said, "I'm not here to help you. I'm here to help me, Doctor." <laughs> <laughs> and so they had this talk. Now, Bill, Bill told Bob all about what happened to him. And Bob said of Bill, he was the first one I had ever spoken to who spoke to me from personal experience about alcohol. So it's easy. You all, we all had people talk down to us. And there was the doctors, the nurses, the bosses, the judges, the cops, the friends. It's but this when that sponsor got hold of you and said, I understand exactly what's going through your head, you miserable, rotten bastard, you know. <laughs> And uh, he told him all of it, five hours. And Bob said, I will do everything you say. This is terrific, Bob said. I'll do everything you say except one thing. I cannot make amends. This is a small town. I'm a physician. I'm on my last hospital affiliation. I'm broke. And the last thing in the world I can do is go around Akron, Ohio, and tell people I've been drunk for the last 25 years. You can't do it. So then they move Bill, moves into Bob's house. Bill says, I'll take what I got. And, and uh, he moves in. And then Bob gets one of those, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Did you ever have one of those thoughts? You know, what the hell am I doing here? That seemed like a good idea at the time. Are you the bridesmaid? That's right. He announces, Bob does, that he's going to the American Medical Association Convention in Atlantic City. Of course, his wife, you can't go there. You get drunk every time you go there. So I'm going. Bill says, not a good idea. He says, I'm going. So he went. He was drunk before he left Akron. And he got drunk, came back. <laughs> and, and his nurse's husband found him fighting in a bar, having a fight in a bar. Nice thing for a doctor, huh? The nurse's husband took him home, threw him on a couch, called up Bob's house and says, I got him. And Ann says, well, he's due at the hospital in the morning at a certain time, and uh, we'll come get him. Bill came out in Bob's car, brought three bottles of beer, and some uh, Eno Bob's, roof balls, they call them then. I took Bob over to the city hospital, gave him the beer, gave him the goof balls, and uh, left him in the car, and Bob went up and worked on some guy's ass. And uh, 
which is what he did, you know, for a living. And, and uh, now it's, you know, in Akron, Ohio, we eat dinner at 5 o'clock. And now it's 5 o'clock, it's dinner time, and there's no Bob, so you know he's drunk. And now it's 7 o'clock, and, and you know he's drunk. And now it's 9 o'clock, he's really done it this time. He shows up at midnight, and he's dry. Never had a drink. And, of course, the first question that came from Bill, where you been? He said, I've been driving around Akron, Ohio, mending fences. It's an old Vermont expression. He was making those amends the very first day that he stopped drinking. You see, what Bob did, he said to Bill, I'll take your program, except for one thing. He said, I will be sober, but I will not make amends. He won a conditional sobriety. I won't do all the steps. I'll do some of the steps. It's not possible in our program to have that kind of sobriety. And the book is a book of experience. And the book they wrote had some of these steps we bought. Correct? We thought we could find an easier, softer way. That's what Bob thought. Bob thought there was an easier, softer way. But the results were nil until we let go and let go absolutely. There is no such thing as conditional sobriety. The book says wife or no wife, job or no job, let no man say. Don't let him say it, that he will only become sober if his family comes back, because we've had the families come back and the guy did not stay sober. And we've had the families never come back and the guy stay sober for the rest of his life. Don't let him say it. That he will do everything except he can't make him. Because he's different. He's a doctor. Because he's special. He's a doctor. Nobody is special. Now, and then of course you know what happened. From then on, we're now we're in Akron, Ohio. And uh, they get filled the next day and, and uh, so forth and so on. And here we are. In 1997, in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I'll tell you this. That's a long, long way from Akron, Ohio. And I'm not talking about geography. That's a long way from Akron, Ohio. A lot of lives since Akron, Ohio. A lot of years since that Ohio. And here we are, you and I. Now I submit to you that none of this is coincidental. I submit that. It's not a coincidence. These people assembled the so way they did before the big war, the first war. They were a cast of characters in a morality play, the author of which was this power that we talk about all the time. And they all had roles to play. And they didn't even know that they had roles to play. They had no idea what they were doing. If you had said to them in 1915, you're going to be all be the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. What? You know. We're just kids having a good time here. We're just trying to, you know, trying to do things. That kids try to do. We don't want to be founders of anything. They don't want to play tennis or golf, you know. That was... Now, I submit all that to you. And I think uh, it's a great story. And I think it's nothing less uh, than a miracle. And then I I get to my my assignment. I was assigned this assignment. And that is to talk to you about our primary purpose. And I'm happy to do so. And I start, everything I I start about is uh, I start talking usually about the book. And in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, that's this book here, the blue book. This is Sammy's book. And when you come in, you read the black part. (laughs) See over here, the black part. You read that part there. Don't go reading this white part. Because if you do, you will go blind. And some of you will go blind from the other thing, so... (laughs) We don't want you to go twice blind here. And then this book was published in 1938. 
39, and for the first time, uh, the 12 steps appear. For the first time, and, uh, they're in the same form they're in now, they're in different forms, it was back and forth. And then in the second edition, they added the 12 traditions. And they're back in, in back of the book 565, in the appendices. Now, here is the problem. The one thing about which there must be unanimous opinion throughout the world is that Alcoholics Anonymous works. About that, there is no doubt and really has never been any doubt. Alcoholics Anonymous works for alcoholics. That we all know about. When I came to Alcoholics in 1965, alcoholism, I'm speaking generally now, was not covered by insurance. Hospitals would not accept a patient, a general hospital, hospital would not accept a patient under the diagnosis of alcoholic. Alcoholics had to go in under some other diagnosis, gastritis, enteritis, colitis, you know, all the itises, uh, they had to be disguised, and then they could dry out, to, you know, under being treated with colitis or something. And the insurance didn't cover it. Now, there have always been places where alcoholics could go, farm, sanitarium. Uh, there's one place in Connecticut that comes to mind, beautiful, nine holes of golf. It's really, it's been there forever. It's for rich people who, who drink too much. But the insurance didn't cover that because on the definition of a policy, insurance policy, under the definition of hospitals, they said a hospital is a place that has operating rooms and nurses and, and uh, delivery or you know, obstetricians and specialities, medical specialities. And none of these places had that, so they never qualified. So the only people who really had the benefit of professional care when it came to alcoholism were the rich who could afford to go to these farms. And we also know that uh, detoxification from uh, alcohol poisoning, is what it is, is a very, very serious matter, and you can die from it, much more so than from the other drugs. Well, in any event, that all began to change in the early 70s, and pretty soon uh, alcoholism was covered by insurance policies, and pretty soon a whole a whole uh, industry grew up of uh, taking care of alcoholics, all covered, all covered by insurance. And the earliest uh, insurance policies all covered 28 days. That was the Blue Cross standard, 28 days. It was seven weeks, uh, four weeks in hospital, 28 days. So the alcoholics got 28 days. And uh, so all of these 28-day programs grew up around the country and... Uh, uh, you know and I know it's nice to get an alcoholic, get them a rest for 28 days, get them off the cycle, get them a while they could detox them in maybe 10 days. And in the early days, they didn't know what to do. Well, they grew up around this industry, and I'm not knocking industry, American capitalism, I'm all for it. Uh, they grew up, they had to grow up with, coextensive with it, a group of people who were going to service the industry. And so therefore, uh, we grew into having alcoholism counselors, uh, which grew into a separate disease. <laughs> and, and there had to be some regulation of these people, so the various states got into licensing these people, and and so these things all grew up together. And then you have a very thriving industry uh, run by alcoholics and counselors who say they are in the field, is the expression they use, they're in the field. And it's only recently now that the cycle is going down. The uh, Most of the major insurance companies now will give you a detox, maybe four days, five days detox, and then the rest is what they call outpatient. You go find an alcoholism counselor in Miami now. They're all in storefronts, you know. Well, once the insurance attached, then they're, they're put in something that we call money. Now, the one thing we all know in our history and our traditions, and ever since Mr. Rockefeller was so smart, he said money is no good for people like this. Don't, no money. Don't give any money. Well, alcoholics should not have money. And uh, we're, we're doomed to communal poverty. Uh, 
except for us lawyers who are an exception to the rule. And deservedly so, Ralph, don't you think? And so, uh, as long as the insurance covered it, pretty soon a lot of people began showing up at alcoholism rehabilitation centers who were not alcoholics. But they were here, they were not alcoholics, but they were in this alcoholism rehabilitation center because they were covered by insurance. And the alcohol rehabilitation center, normally speaking, only has the one van. <laughs> so they can't be driving them all over town to various meetings. And they know AA works, so they would take them to the AA meeting. And we're so dopey that we let them in. Because we're full of love <laughs> and tolerance. That's our code. And every once in a while, there'd be some hard ass like me who would say to one of these gentlemen, "What do you What do you want here?" <laughs> that's well, I'm an addict. I know, but you're not. What do you want here? This is not for addicts, no way. Well, that's people like me were fairly rare. And what I'd be, they would tell them at the hospital. Tell them when you get there. Tell, make sure you tell me you're an alcoholic. Because especially if you go to his group, because if you don't tell him an alcoholic, he'll, he'll throw you out. So make sure you tell me you're an alcoholic. So they'd all show up and they alcoholic. Then they talk fast. They say alcoholic addict. It's like a hyphen. I'm an alcoholic addict, or I'm an addict alcoholic. And then we got all the anders came by. They really should say I'm an alcoholic and ander, right? And ander. And if you cause a fuss, they say the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Correct? And they take their third tradition and stick it up your noodle. Now I'm going to read to you the third tradition in the long form. And we'll start that way. You ready? Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that as a group they have no other affiliation. Now, I submit to you that the third tradition limits Alcoholics Anonymous to alcoholics. The name of the book would give you a clue. <laughs> the fifth tradition... No, that's not right. Where's the other tradition? Yes. The first tradition, I thought it was right. Each alcoholic anonymous group ought to be a spiritual entity and love and tolerance. I'm talking about love and tolerance. Having but one primary purpose. And that phrase, but one primary purpose, is italicized. It's underlined here. Okay? That of carrying its message to the alcoholic who still suffer. I do not have a message for our non-alcoholics because I don't have any non-alcoholic experience. How would I bring a message to a non-alcoholic when I don't know anything about non-alcohol? My experience is of an alcoholic and that's what we share here. And I'm not putting anybody down and I'm not, uh, you know, remonstrating with anybody and I'm not saying I'm better or worse than anybody else. I am telling you what is an absolute truth. Alcoholics Anonymous is for alcoholics. What in the name of God is so complicated about that? Is that complicated? Narcotics Anonymous is for narcotics. Overeating Anonymous is for overeating. Time Magazine if you credit Tom Magazine or anything. Some years ago, I wrote a story, as you know, they usually do, Newsweek just had one, 
about alcohol. It pops up every few years or so. And uh, Time Magazine said there were 500 organizations that ended in anonymous. Did you conceive of that? 500. Including former owners of Edsel. <laughs> whose lives turned to shit when they bought Edsel. <laughs> People who hate their brothers-in-law. It was amazing, the stuff they had there. And they all traced it back, of course, to alcohol town. There's an 800 number. There's an 800 number. You call in Manhattan, New York City. You, you call the 800 number. You tell them your problem, they tell you where to go. You say, I'm sticking bananas up my ass. <laughs> And I cannot stop. <laughs> and they say, Church of the Heavenly Rest, 2 o'clock. <laughs> Bring your own banana. <laughs> for every everything, they got a thing. For everything, they got a thing. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely unlimited. It's absolutely unlimited. Now, our 12th step of our program is like all of the stuff in our program, very, very simple. It says we we try, you and I, carry this message, and the message of Alcoholics Anonymous is not stop drinking. That's not the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. The message of Alcoholics Anonymous is you will be able to relate yourself once again to God. When Alcoholics Anonymous was 25 years old, the grapevine recently reprinted the correspondence between Bill Wilson and the great Carl Jung. And Bill Wilson wrote Carl Jung in 1960 on our 25th anniversary. He said, Dr. Jung, we of Alcoholics Anonymous consider you to be a founder because of your advice to Roland Hazen, that led to Debbie Thatcher, that led to Bill Wilson, that led to Bob Smith, and so forth. He got back a very nice letter from uh, Dr. Jung. And Dr. Jung said, I remember Roland Hazen said his problem was that he had separated himself from the whole, W-H-O-L-E, in medieval language from a union with God. Huh? Dr. Young knew that Roland has his problem was not that he drank like a pig. That's just how the problem manifested itself. Dr. Young knew that Roland Hazard's spirit was the thing that was affected. And Dr. Young even made a joke in Latin. And to show you, I'm erudite. He said, spiritus contra spiritum. You see, in Latin, the same word for spirit is the word for alcohol. Spirits, you know, wine and spirits. Spiritus, he says, spirits against spirits. And that's what alcoholism is. It comes and it takes our spirit away. It comes to that creature that comes in the middle of the night with the terror and reaches in. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.